Hello, my name is Louis Luque, and I'm the Global OT Security Lead for Accenture. Welcome to Accenture Security's Operational Technology Cyber Fusion Center in downtown Houston. Over the past couple of years, our team has been investing around the world in the build out of cyber ranges that model the actual industrial hardware and software utilized by our critical infrastructure and industrial manufacturing clients. Here in Houston, where we have a dense concentration of our energy clients, we have built out an environment that simulates the full energy value chain, from collecting hydrocarbons to transporting and processing them. In addition to emulating the real world physical aspects of the industrial process, we also have a diverse representation of security technology solutions. This allows us to replicate our clients' existing and proposed architectures as they evaluate the best way to cost effectively apply security to legacy industrial control systems or evolving IoT deployments. One of Accenture Security's most important overall technology partners is Microsoft. While we work with Microsoft across many different dimensions of our business, we are really excited to be partnering with Microsoft on its new Azure Defender for IoT product. We believe that combining Accenture Security's unique OT security capability and unmatched global scale with Microsoft's innovative IoT security offering will help accelerate our client's journey to securing their industrial assets. Now, Jacob Marsloff will show us a live walkthrough of our OT Cyber Fusion Center, along with a demonstration of the Azure Defender for IoT solution. Jacob? Thanks, Lewis. My name is Jacob Marsloff, and I'm a member of Accenture's OT security team here based out of Houston. I'm really excited today to show you what we have built here in our Cyber Fusion Center and how some of these tools integrate with Azure Defender for IoT to help you detect and respond to attacks on your industrial control networks. So before we get started and go into Azure, let's take a look at what we've built and what these, some of these systems behind me are. So we have this separated into three distinct sections behind me. We have our upstream, midstream, and on the far side, downstream sections of our cyber range. These terms refer to oil and gas, and, and it's split up into those three distinct sections to replicate the energy value chain within oil and gas industries. Now, while it's an oil and gas specific term because, well, we're based here out of Houston, uh, these control systems and the different systems that, are, that take, are integrated together really can be used across a variety of industries. These systems are not specific to oil and gas, although our terminology might be right now. So in the upstream section, this is where oil comes up out of the ground. That is integrated into our midstream section, which is where oil and gas products are sent across the world in an array of pipelines. And then on the far side, we also have our downstream section, which is where oil and gas products are refined into final products like jet fuel and gasoline. Um, but we've made these systems operate together to replicate what we see in our client environments so that we can install the security tools and do the hard work of creating reference architectures that work and integrate without causing any downtime. Before we get into the attack, uh, I want to show that these control systems are working, right? And I want you to remember, whenever I'm pressing these buttons, it's going to work. Because by the end of this demo, I'm going to demonstrate we've attacked and taken down one of these control systems. So if we look at our upstream, if I flow the water here, you'll see behind me that the models are moving up and down, and water will start to move between the tanks, moving all the way down through downstream, replicating that oil and gas value chain. So the important point here is just remember, this works, these control systems are real, and we're going to attack one now. Now let's take a look at what a real world attack would look like against one of these industrial control networks that we've seen with our OT incident response and threat hunting. So our team here at Accenture has developed a series of scripts which replicates a well-known APT or advanced persistent threat known as Black Ghost Knifefish or Dragonfly 2.0. This APT is Russian state sponsored and targets US critical infrastructure such as energy, oil and gas, utilities and others. They have a well known list of tactics, techniques and procedures which we have replicated on our systems to show the impact of one of these attacks on your critical infrastructure to see how widespread it could really be. To go through the attack, we start with the APT infiltrating the IT networks on phase one. In phase two, the APT infiltrates the OT network and gains some information about the OT. And finally, in phase three, the APT formulates a specific targeted attack against one of our industrial control systems, which actually breaks it and takes down the industrial control system. So let's take a look at phase one in more detail. So in phase one, the APT sends out a targeted spear phishing campaign to specific users in the organization. Those users then open the attachments in the spear phishing emails and install a remote access Trojan. The APT at this point is able to remote into the network and scan and see open ports on the IT network that go into OT. 
So at the end of phase one, the APT has persistent access into the IT network. They have valid credentials that they're able to use to log in, and they know that there are open ports into OT. So now in phase two, the APT is able to remote in and connect into that OT network that they discovered in phase one. At this point, they're able to run another port scan, see devices on the OT network, and scrape credentials from valid engineering workstations on the OT networks. This is dangerous because now they have real credentials that they can use to launch engineering applications and get the logic control file off the PLCs. What this really means is that they know exactly how this process works and what to do to manipulate it. In order to formulate the final phase of the attack, they move the files off-site so that they can work offline and come up with phase three where they bring down the control system. So finally, in phase three, the APT remotes back into the OT network to upload their malicious file into the PLC. They've had time to analyze the very specific process that this PLC controls, and they know exactly what to do to produce instability in the system. At the same time that they upload this malicious file, they also install and trigger ransomware across IT and OT networks. They're not looking for a ransom. They don't want you to pay the ransom. What they want to do is distract your incident response teams from seeing the true attack on the industrial control system. So now let's take a look and see how this affected our control system in the real world. So now we've run our demo scripts replicating the APT attacking one of our control systems. As you can see now, the control system behind me is completely down and I am no longer able to operate the process. No matter what buttons I press on this screen, the pumps will not move, water does not move from tank to tank, and if I'm an operator in the field, I have no idea what just happened. There's not an error message on here telling me there's an attack, there's just a generic error. So imagine this being so widespread that it would affect multiple stations within your company. If we look at oil and gas for an example, one compressor station being controlled by one of these PLCs could cost about three to $600,000 per hour in downtime, and it's going to take a lot longer than one hour to resolve this issue. So that's why it's extremely important to have the right detection tools in place with the right architecture early so that you can detect these attacks before something catastrophic happens. So now let's take a look at what we've done in our Cyberfusion Center to detect and respond to attacks just like this. Here at our Cyberfusion Center, we've deployed a number of physical and virtual Azure Defender for IoT sensors that are monitoring our OT networks passively. It's extremely important that these devices work passively because any introduced network noise onto an OT network could cause disruption with some of the, the critical equipment such as PLCs and other control systems in the field. So all of those sensors together report up to their management console, which can either be virtual or physical, on-premise or in the cloud, and then we send all of the logs that come from those sensors into our Azure instance. So now let's take a look at what the management console looks like, and then we're gonna look, go into an individual sensor to see some of the reporting capabilities that are available and how actionable some of these alerts are. So here on our advanced dashboard, we're able to see a high level view of all the different systems that are on our network, the different alert activity, and see devices that are talking to each other that have a high number of alerts. We can scroll down and see other alerts by type, the trends over time, and it's really important to understand what the trends are over time because if you don't know what normal is in your network, then how will you ever know what anything abnormal is? So you need to have that baseline in place in order to understand when something malicious may happen or even if there's just a misconfiguration on your network. All of these dashboards are powered by Power BI uh, using custom integrations with the Defender for IoT sensors to pull data out of the various databases and generate these reports. Here in one of the individual sensors uh, that we have deployed in our Cyberfusion Center, we can see all the different devices that the Azure Defender for IoT sensor has passively discovered. In particular, we're looking at our upstream cabinet now. Now, if we want to get a better view from a security model of these devices, we can choose to lay out all of these devices by Purdue model, which is going to automatically separate the devices into level one, two, three, four, and five. That is important because if we scroll down here, we can see that our controllers and other control system equipment are now grouped into level one, and we can see the different connections that they may have up into the other levels here as well. So this gives you a good view into where your devices are communicating, where they're located at a particular site, and what those cross communications look like. 
Now, while it's great to see all these devices in a map like this, it's also really good to be able to see them in a list. One of the biggest problems in OT networks is that nobody knows what's on them. There's a big black hole for a lot of organizations. They don't know what's on the network, which is a big problem for security because how do you secure what you don't know about? So having a list of the devices and assets on the network is great because the operators are able to use this for attestation, to go through as a checklist, see what's on the network. They can see if anything new has been added onto this list that they didn't know about. And they can go through and see some of that activity, which may or may not actually be malicious, but could cause problems or network interruption in the control system. So outside of the device inventory, what's, what Defender for IoT is really great at is giving context and life to these devices. And the, the way that it does that is by generating alerts that it's able to detect passively on the network by looking and sniffing at the, those various packets that these devices are uh, communicating with. So we're able to see a number of alerts that are being generated by devices here in our Cyber Fusion Center, such as the illegal he header content, unauthorized internet connectivity, which would be a great thing to hone in on to try to define whether or not this device truly needs to connect to the internet, who is connecting to it, do they need to have remote access. Essentially, this is the jumping off pad for you to take action on these alerts in your OT network. Now, alerts by themselves are great, um, but we even get more context with Defender for IoT. So if we hop over into the event timeline, we can see a generated list of alerts that have happened over time and how they may or may not be correlated with one another. An alert with no context is valuable, but it's more valuable to know how it's connected to other things that are going on the network so that you can scroll back in time and see what was causing that alert to happen in the first place and really get to the heart of the remediation and troubleshoot faster. So if we scroll through the event timeline here and we can see a number of events that have happened for the past few hours. So for instance, we may see that there was a PLC program upload, but more importantly, we can see that the remote connection was established a few minutes prior to that then there was a connection between the two devices, and then finally there was a PLC program upload, which did send an alert. So now we know the full timeline of the event, which gives us a faster time to resolution for any of these issues. So in addition to the event timeline and looking through various alerts, we can also generate a number of reports using Defender for IoT, and that can be used by a variety of teams within your organization, such as vulnerability management. So let's take a look at how CVEs can be categorized and how you can send this along to your organization. So if we go into the data mining area, double click on CVEs, we very quickly have a report generated that shows devices with known CVEs and the score of that CVE, showing where your most vulnerable devices are. Where applicable, we can also see a description of the CVE, and all of this data can be exported out, whether it's into CSV or into a PDF. So it's important to be able to export this data from Defender for IoT because this data can be used by multiple teams throughout your organization. For instance, your field operators may be able to use the Excel spreadsheet to compare and contrast with their existing asset inventory to see the devices that they know about and maybe discover devices that they didn't know about that are vulnerable. In addition, your vulnerability management team will be able to look at this report and get a good sense of how secure or how vulnerable your OT network actually is. Now, outside of report generation, we can also look at a number of dashboards which are available within Defender for IoT. If we go into the investigation tab, we can see dashboards that have already been created. And it's very simple to put these widgets onto your dashboard to customize it for your industry's needs or even that specific site's needs. Because as we all know, every single facility is unique in its own way. So if here, we can see the number of new devices that have been detected over time by our Defender for IoT sensor. This is giving a baseline of what's normal, right? So as you can see, in the past, it was normal to see between two and five devices come onto the network that would have never been discovered before. But all of a sudden, we see 78 new devices being discovered, meaning that there was probably quite a bit of change in the network and could point towards a potential security violation. We're also able to see the number of incidents and how they're grouped by type, separated into operational, malware, anomaly, and others that have been detected. Operational incidents aren't necessarily security violations, but they can be used to increase operational efficiencies on the network and avoid outages and potential downtime. Obviously, you'd want to go in and investigate your malware if you see any, but you could also see some various protocol violations and anomalies on the network. 
Now, if you wanted to see something different on this dashboard, it's very simple to go in and see, for instance, busy devices and see which devices are communicating with the most volume on the network. So let's add that and take a look. And we can see that on average, the device here is communicating substantially more than anything else on our network. That may be fine, it may not be an issue, but it's worth an investigation and it's a place to start. Another useful feature within Defender for IoT is the, the risk assessment and report generation that is available. So if we go into risk assessments, it's very simple to go through and generate your own report. I'll let this one run in the background, but I've generated one in the past that we're gonna take a look at now. If we go into the risk assessment, we can see an executive level summary of the risk from this asset that the sensor has been able to, to pick up, seeing the number of vulnerable devices, maybe some devices that need improvement, and the number of devices overall. With all of this information combined with the, the data down below, we can get an overall security score for our site. And what's great about this is that as we make changes to our network, as we increase our security posture, we can rerun the, the report generation to see how our score increases over time. This gives us a very targeted list of actions to take and things that we need to fix on our network. As we scroll down through the assessment, we can see the executive summary here with the number of devices by Mac vendor, the number of protocols that are being used, the security risks, and various mitigations. Now as we go down the page, we get into the real action for the technical team. These actions include ports that are in use by a certain device. So if you need to create a firewall rule, you can model it based on the data that you see here inside your risk assessment. You can also see any CVEs that may be associated with this device so that you can go on and take further action to increase the security posture of your networks. So now I wanna go into one of the most actionable parts of Defender for IoT, which is based on the machine learning algorithms that are running in the background, constantly analyzing the different events and alerts that are coming into the sensor. The machine learning algorithm is able to assign a Bayesian score to the various alerts that are coming through, and we can go through and simulate an actual attack vector in your OT network, so you can see gaps and go through and try to find remediations that make sense. So what I'm going to do now is just make a demo attack vector simulation. I'll go through and add the simulation. It will only takes a few seconds for this to pull up some good data. As we can see here, there are a number of attacks that have been identified. If we can scroll through, let me pick one of these in particular. I will go for, let's see, this attack here. So I wanted to find something that was going across different subnets. So you can see here the 192.168.90 to 192.168.20. What the Defender for IoT sensor is doing is simulating what would happen and the traffic flow that would have to happen for an attacker to come in through an internet connection and make a connection into a vulnerable device. So we can see here, there's an exposed internet connection here on this 192.168.90 device. From there, they would be able to pivot and go down into different subnets and start trolling through the network to find more devices. How we can take this data and make it actionable for our administ administrators in the organization is to look through, find the subnet that we want to exclude, let's say in a firewall rule. We can go back in, edit our attack vector, and we'll exclude that specific subnet. So if I want to exclude the 20 subnet from my firewall rule, I'm going to edit the simulation, let it rerun, which will take just a few more seconds. And as you can see here, that attack vector has fallen off the list. What this tells me as an administrator is that if I implement this firewall rule, then that will be sufficient for blocking that connection and making sure the attacker is no longer able to pivot. So since there are so many different connections on this network, as we saw earlier on the network map, it's possible that just blocking that entire subnet could break real functionality on the control system. So let's take a look at what we could do to simulate how that firewall rule would affect other devices on the network. So if we go back into the device map, remember we want to exclude that 192.168.90 subnet. We open up this menu here and scroll down to where we can see cross subnet connections. This is identifying and categorizing all the different connections that go across subnets, which can then hopefully be blocked by a firewall rule. Now we were looking at the 192.168.90.220, which is right here. So if we now filter, 
we can see all the devices that are on this network and any connections that they may have. If I click onto one device on the subnet, hold down shift, click onto the other device, I'm able to go through and see any sort of connection details that exist between these two devices. This is extremely useful information for a network administrator to know exactly which ports are being used between these two devices, how often they connect, when they're connecting, before they make the firewall rule. It's possible that they could block all the ports or maybe they just want to block or even enable a certain port. This screen here allows you to make an intelligent decision before making a firewall rule change, which could cause an outage at a facility. It's extremely important to be able to simulate these events ahead of time to make sure that you do not lose any production efficiencies. Now that we've taken a look at a lot of the different features that are available within the Defender for IoT sensor itself, I want to pivot over and take a look at what's available in Azure Sentinel and how all of this integrates in with the Azure Defender for IoT sensors. So here we have a custom dashboard that we've created inside of Azure Sentinel that's specifically looking at the Defender for IoT alerts. Similarly to what we showed before, we'd see a trend over time of the different types of alerts that are occurring and how often they are occurring. Same reason as before, we need to understand what the baseline is so that we can understand when something abnormal happens on the network. Clearly something happened on this day where we need to start an investigation. As we go down the screen, we can see another grouping of the alerts, helping us hone in on specific issues that may be happening on our network. So here we even have our events separated by stream. So that's upstream, midstream, and downstream, which is just analogous to having this separated into the different business lines for, for yourself. Um, this would be similar to looking at a number of assets in your industry, whether you have 10 assets spread around the globe or you have 500. You want to be able to consolidate that up into an executive view and then be able to click down and to see the individual assets so you can hone in on the problem quickly. So having dashboards available like this really helps the analysts see all of this information from a different view and a different pane of glass, which helps them to distill the information quicker and get to those resolutions faster. Another huge component here with having the data available in Azure Sentinel is that you can utilize all of the functionality within Azure to create various automations through your network, whether you have a certain comfort level for wanting to automate the response to some of your security instance, or whether that's just automatically creating a ticket so that there's always a human in the loop before making any decisions on your critical networks. Our team here at Accenture is really proud of our partnership with Microsoft. We've been able to do everything from deploy sensors and field networks, make sure that they're configured in a reliable and repeatable fashion, all the way to making those connections into Azure and getting that data surfaced at the cloud level. We're really excited to see where our partnership goes next. Thanks for joining Accenture and Microsoft for this tour of the Operational Technology Cyber Fusion Center. I hope you have a better understanding of what Accenture security can do for you if your business is confronted by cyber threats. Please stick around for a live Q&A session hosted by Microsoft. Excellent. Thank you, and uh, Lewis and team, uh, all of Accenture. I was really, really great overview of exactly what was available to uh, any customer base, uh, whether that be in energy, uh, retail, or any other kinds of logistics or anything else that might include this, uh, both operational technology as well as uh, Internet of Things. Um, the great walkthrough of the entire thing. My name is James Cabe. I'm a global black belt for Microsoft. I came over with this CyberX acquisition. And as you can tell, we've already inured ourselves and, and created a, a platform within the, the Microsoft uh, uh, architecture. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my video on. I'm sorry, I thought we were going to keep the video off for the time being, but I'll, I'll go ahead and have it on. No big deal. Um, so so uh, uh, thank you very much for, for coming here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start opening the floor for questions. So if there's anything that's actually going to be in there and published, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so if there's any uh, questions you might have, whether that comes from operational technology, whether it comes from typical cybersecurity, uh, Lewis and I are on on the phone, um, you know, we're here to answer any of those questions. Uh, Lewis, would you like to say something before we get started? Um, thanks, James. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the transition. You guys have been a great partner in terms of helping us within our uh, OT Cyber Fusion Center. I'll just make a couple of comments that we've seen, you know, um, over this last year of COVID and, 
and uh, sort of the corresponding you know drop in, in oil prices. Historically, for our business, you know most of uh, maybe ninety percent of our our work in the OT uh, security space has really been around utilities, chemicals, oil and gas, and so forth. But over the last year, we've seen a huge shift in sort of the the demand from other industries like healthcare, pharmaceuticals, consumer packaged goods, defense, automotive, etc. And so we've been uh, with sort of the adoption of cloud and these new industries investing in OT security. It's really great to have a partnership with Microsoft as we kind of branch into to other verticals. So thanks again for uh, facilitating this. Now, Lewis, you came from the acquisition. You came from an acquisition there at Accenture as well. You uh, you had Simation beforehand, um, so you have kind of a deep understanding, especially on the OT technology side. Can you? kind of explain to us or, or maybe um, uh, you know, just kind of give us an overview of exactly how threats have actually evolved over uh, a period of time and what you're seeing now? Sure, yeah. So as you mentioned, it came in probably six years ago through, through an acquisition. Uh, my background is a mix of uh, pure kind of OT engineering uh, as well as the, uh, the security side and built up the team. You know, our, our team is made up of folks who've been on the operations side. Uh, been been on the owner uh, asset owner side as well as folks who have come from the engineering side and so we we have seen I guess uh, you know the threats evolve in in terms of you know there it's easier to um, uh, to develop these threats we see the tools advancing both kind of from the ransomware side as well as uh, kind of you know uh, the more specific tools targeted at, at OT and the vulnerabilities are sort of increasing at, at pace and so we've, you know, we are working with our clients to really help them understand, you know, how do you put in controls to, to protect these sensitive networks, but also how do you create uh, incident response plans? How do you create sort of really uh, robust backup and recovery plans? Because no matter what you're doing in terms of addressing OT security risk, um, because of the sensitive nature and, and sort of the size of the clients that we typically work with, it's going to take a long time. So we always encourage folks to invest in incident response plans for OT. It's handled differently than in, on the IT side. Um, develop those plans. You know, cloud is, is becoming more and more a part of it. So, you know, it's usually a multidiscipline team. And so, you know, while we, we have a lot of uh, you know, pure engineers on, on our team, including PEs, you know, really is great working with our, our broader security team in areas like cloud security, identity, because that's becoming more and more of, of you know, involved and integrated into the uh, kind of OT security landscape. So that's funny that you say that because um, I still hear the occasional, um, we have air gap for that. We need to actually have, you know, this kind of operational separation between them. And I can understand uh, when it comes to companies that create FOSG and gas. And since I'm a Houstonian myself, like, like you guys, um, I know that those plants are not very far away from a bunch of homes. And so, uh, you know, plastics manufacturing produces sorts of that sorts of things. Um, it's also used in cracking towers whenever you're creating uh, different types of fuels, those sorts of things. So um, what is your response whenever it comes to the disappearance uh, of, of some of those air gaps? And I'll say in many cases, whenever we have gone in as a team uh, for Azure Defender for IoT, gone in and done an assessment for companies, um, they're probably better than 80 to 85 percent of them are surprised about what they do find when it comes to uh, connectivity, either to the Internet or outside cloud. How is your own experience? Yeah, I think um, you know our experience is the same, and I don't think that the air gap uh, piece is disappearing. It's just the uh, perspective that there there was one to begin with. Um, <laughs> while there are examples of of air gapped package systems that were not networked for for some reason or another, it still is you know predominantly uh, connected in in some way. Um, usually, the the business needs some sort of connectivity into the control systems to pass formulas or recipes in a, in a batch process or to control orders in, in some way. So there's usually you know, some sort of analytics data coming back and forth. So it's really just getting visibility around those conduits and, and sort of the data flows. And um, we also see a trend where there are a lot more site-led, you know, kind of facility-led initiatives around IoT. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of the vendors are you know, finding new ways to derive analytics, uh, very valuable analytics around their equipment and they're, they're selling to asset owners. 
so that they have their own cloud connectivity and some of the arms those are those are bought at the the site level and not run through a traditional kind of security organization um, centrally so we just see a, a lot more sprawl around iot and it really is important to get that visibility not only from understanding what the assets are but just understanding how those connections are, are flowing and and where your risks are and trying to put you know the the appropriate constraints on you know, who has access to the networks and sort of how they're they're going about accessing those networks uh, that's a lot of good color actually um so so i hate to act as your interviewer but uh i'm getting a lot of good responses um so i hope you don't mind about the interrogation mm -hmm. uh, so so you know one of the things that i really really love hearing about is this this what what the differences between iot ot and even iiot is and i've always explained it to everybody is IIoT is when you try to bolt on internet onto the old OT stuff. And then IoT is this net new sort of built directly for the cloud or may even have a cloud console kind of thing. What is your perspective on it? And and, and what do you think see the penetration uh, for those sorts of things so far? Do you see more people going to the IIoT with media gateways and things like that? Or or what you know what what are you uh, what have y'all seen so far i suppose sure well, i think our, again i think our our experience is, is similar um because there's such a huge uh, existing legacy footprint of industrial control systems a lot of our clients are focused on securing those those legacy assets we uh, you know have a number of engagements um both within our security practice but also our, our broader digital transformation practice around you know, what does the next generation architecture look like? How do we, how do we um, help clients gain the value of whether it's analytics, kind of edge computing and so forth. So we see purpose built sensor to cloud uh, examples um, where clients are asking us, you know, what, what is the proper architecture? We have, um, you know, our OT Cyber Fusion Center in Houston, uh, as an example, is where that, uh, where we, we filmed this, this video we're able to work with clients to iterate on that next generation architecture. We have you know, Azure Cloud connectivity there, we have legacy assets. And so we're able to sort of mix and match and, and iterate on, on that next generation architecture. So I think we're gonna see you know, both pieces for a long time. And it, it does kind of, you know, the acronyms sort of blur together, but uh, essentially we have, you know, for me, the distinction is the consequences, right? So if it's monitor only, um, you know, that can be treated in, in a certain way, whether it's, you know, an external connection or it's being monitored from a corporate environment. Um, and it, if it's truly monitoring and the conduits cannot be used for for control or cannot be uh, exploited, you know, that that's sort of handled one way. But anytime there's true control um, that that can be, you know, pushed down um, and create, you know, issues, safety issues, uh, operational issues, you know, the, the way that those things should be handled, you know, are, are slightly different and we need to kind of respect the consequence side. And so really it's, it's a risk-based approach um, and to understand that risk, it is sort of a, a multidiscipline review of, you know, what can happen, what is the perceived sort of impact and then what's the reality of it. And it, it does take, you know, folks from the engineering side, usually there's a vendor component to it and, you know, obviously people from the business to really understand what the, the kind of financial impact would be. Yeah, I get that. There's a big difference between what they people refer to as uh, uh, cyber risk and uh, actual business risk. And, and it's really, really a tough thing to put both of them together. Um, it requires a lot of heads in the room, uh, a team, team effort, if you will. So I've been to the OTCFC um, uh, there in downtown Houston. It's really impressive. I think y'all are even below or above uh, one of the largest Equinix data centers in the entire region. And I know that y'all can even wheel crash carts uh, directly into that, that Equinix data center. Where did all these capabilities come from? I mean, would someone want to go and build out the same thing you have? I, I saw, and I, th I think everybody saw the videos. It's really impressive. And I know a lot of people uh, are super jealous of the lab. You know, how would customers take advantage of that? And, you know, using you guys and, and you know, should they build go out and build their own? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I think probably over the last two and a half years, um, we've been building out, you know, what we're calling OT cyber ranges. And reason is, you know, we have, uh, again, a pretty broad customer base and we have lots of clients that, that come through our facilities, our innovation hubs um, and so forth. And we realized that there are a lot of shiny objects uh, out there, a lot of, you know, startups that are focused in, in are beginning to focus on OT security. There are a lot of existing tools. And so we wanted to help clients understand what, 
what would these tools look like in, in practice? And a lot of our clients come come to us with technical debt uh, and you know looking to see you know what can they they leverage from their existing investments, and then what tools will help them gain capabilities that that make sense. And so we're able to sort of mix and match the different technologies to help them understand you know where would they have coverage, where would it be worth investing. So Houston is our um, our prim primary place, but we have you know multiple sites in in Germany, uh, Garching, Germany, yes, in Germany. We have a facility in uh, uh, OT Cyber Range in DC, and then we have others in in other parts and in, in building more. And really, our our investments are to for a couple of reasons. So we're helping clients understand you know what tools are out there. Uh, we're helping clients understand you know what sort of what you saw kind of in the video that there are real consequences to not addressing OT security and those consequences are different than some of the traditional IT security consequences and sometimes there's sort of a mix um, uh, of both right some some IT events can impact you know operational facilities um, we also use the facilities to help develop our own people you know there just aren't enough uh, resources in in the world to help address all the companies that are are uh, looking at OT security investments now. Really every industrial client in the world has sort of gotten a, a sudden focus on this and we use it to train our own teams. We use it for kind of our innovation agenda. So we're able to understand what, what are the opportunities for orchestration? What are the opportunities to use kind of uh, OT tool? I mean, IT tools that we've used in our incident response uh, with our incident response team, you know, what are the processes, playbooks, and so forth that we can leverage in an OT environment? Not not uh, every tool or methodology is applicable for an OT environment. So we've been able to work with our teams from our uh, MDR practice, managed detect response practice. We're able to work with you know, our teams that are focused on Sentinel, for example, you know, and cloud. How do we make these pieces work together? So, you know, all of our environments are kind of dual purpose. Uh, we have internal um, internal mechanisms and, and sort of capabilities that we're developing uh, at these facilities, but we're also working with clients to, to collaborate. And so in terms of how some of our clients are, are leveraging this environment, we have, you know, in, in Houston, for example, we have utility clients, we have some uh, industrial manufacturing clients that were looking at building out their own um, uh, cyber ranges or testing facilities. Once we kind of did a tour and showed them what, what we had, they said, well, you guys probably have 80% of what we were going to build. Can we just send you the pieces that are unique to our business and build on, on that environment and then we can work together? And, and so that's, we kind of have a, a uh, kind of cyber range or or lab as a, as a service model that we work with clients on. You know, an example more recently is we have a a industrial manufacturing client that was looking at building out um, uh, OT DMZs in the cloud, and we were able to build that out, do proofs of concept in our our facility, and then transition that to their cloud environment, and then kind of build out an aggressive schedule to you know roll that out to to their different manufacturing sites. And so, you know, we, we work with clients in different ways, but we're we're very flexible. And you know, I, I would encourage, you know, it took us a material amount of of investment and time to build this out. And if uh, speed is is part of you know the, the client's challenge, then yeah, definitely it would probably make sense to to work with us in that space. Yeah, and I know that we we tell people we point them at the Azure portal just to get started now, which which is quite different from when we were CyberX, uh, where we would point mostly at our partners to do that. Um, I still do point at partners because it's an extremely complex piece of technology. Um, how how would someone get started in, in the, all the things that you mentioned? What what's the first step for them? Uh, what can we charge them with uh, before we get off the phone? Um, do you mean in terms of tackling the the broader OT security? Um, yeah. How do you get started on it? Um, you know, what what is their first step if they were to go on this call and say, "We need to do this. This needs to be something we go do." Um, you know, I need to go present a a plan to the board, uh, or at least get started with leadership. What what should they what should be their first step um, if they wanted to get started with you guys? Sure. Um, it it kind of depends on the the maturity of of the client. I, you know, I, I'm a bit conflicted in in that answer. In that, you know, the typical answer is to to do some sort of assessment and understand where you are. But I think most people have been assessed to death. And if I was going to invest money, uh, I would prefer investing it in fixing the problem versus admiring the problem. But you know, if you don't have some base assessment or evaluation 
already, then you, you do need to start with some uh, light assessment of understanding. But if if you're just getting started in this space, there are a lot of common areas around asset discovery, some of the basic networking, you know, network separation, um, some of the governance model pieces, incident response, backup and recovery, kind of the, the standard items. If those have not been started uh, and you know that, then I would, you know, if I had to choose investing in going to validate that those aren't there versus going to actually, you know, roll out either technology or processes to fix it, I would encourage folks to, you know, start down a path of, of investing in uh, fixing the the problem. So hit the basics and, you know, really kind of try to get some some robust processes in place and where there are new technologies that need to be invested in you know look at evaluating that technology work with a partner to, to help you evaluate those um and you know again look at the, your existing investments sometimes people are are unaware of either how things can be re-architected to leverage those investments or you know looking at um you know are there tool sets like with microsoft that they may already have an investment in and it makes sense to just extend some of the capabilities or you know kind of product solutions uh, on top of let's say a microsoft uh, tool set to to get more coverage you know look at what you have and, and sort of build off of that all right thanks appreciate it but I think that it, we're getting close to being wrapped up. Um, it, was there anything else from the rest of the team? Alrighty then. Uh, thanks everybody for coming in today. Uh, again, my name is James Cabe of Global Black Belt for uh, Microsoft and uh, Louis Luque uh, with Accenture, uh, the leader over there, especially over the OT uh, CFC as well as a lot of the OT practice. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, you go ahead and scan the QR code there um, and it should bring up a link to go ahead and fill something out. Thank you very much for coming today and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.